All right, so today I want to give you 10 reasons why your snake eggs may not hatch if you're into breeding snakes. And let me tell you, my very first year in ball pythons, I had quite a few eggs that didn't survive. And as a matter of fact, I learned quite a few tips along the way, did a lot of research into it. And in this video, I want to share those tips with you so you can maximize your production of hatchlings. All right, so the number one thing that got me on my very first year breeding ball pythons, and that is I didn't have enough humidity in my egg boxes. And it's kind of interesting because a lot of people do their egg boxes a little bit different. You start watching all these YouTube videos, you know, some people will use a perlite or a vermiculite water mixture. Some people actually just do like an egg crate directly over water with no other substrate in the water. It's kind of interesting. And my very first year, what I was doing, is I was doing a 50-50 vermiculite water and I would weigh them out. For example, I'd do like 200 grams of vermiculite, 200 grams of water, and then I'd mix it together. So I had enough water in the egg box, you know, with all the humidity and everything. But the problem is, is I actually drilled some holes in the sides of the egg box or kind of cracked the lid a little bit or put some holes in the lid. And let me tell you, in this environment here in Colorado where it's almost like a desert, that was too much air in those egg boxes. As a matter of fact, if, if you're actually incubating eggs and you see that you don't have enough humidity, pretty much what you'll see is the eggs start shrinking down more and more and more so they'll almost flatten out like a pancake. And if, if they get if they lose a lot of humidity and they lose a lot of the moisture inside of the egg, essentially what happens is the egg gets smaller and smaller and then the embryo can't properly develop within the egg. And I've pretty much gone just the opposite way where I have almost 100% humidity in my egg boxes. What I did to fix it is I actually completely seal up the egg box with press and seal. I use press and seal right on top of the egg box with no holes or no ventilation and I'm pretty convinced that you can't have too much humidity in there. If you have you know upwards of 100% humidity I don't think it's a problem for your eggs. It's only when they dry out. All right, so the number two reason that you may run into problems hatching out snake eggs, and that is genetic defects. For example, if you actually bred two ball pythons together that both contain the spider gene, you're gonna end up with 25% of the hatchlings containing super spider, which is two copies of the spider gene, which is a lethal combination. So for example, if I bred, you know, like a spider pied and a spider pied together, and 25% of the eggs, I would probably, would probably, you know, partially develop and then they would die within the egg because they contain the super spider. And I, I would say you really have to be careful of some of these genetic anomalies. Not only that, but I actually have two albinos, a male and a female that I bred together one year and I had problems with that clutch where I had really super small hatchlings on about half of them and a couple that were really deformed and partially formed in the egg and then died in the egg. So in that case, I would probably avoid pairing up up those two snakes in the future. All right, so the third reason you may have problems with some of the eggs in your clutches, and that is you may actually get some slugs, which are infertile eggs. And I'm convinced that slugs are a result of not pairing up your male with your female enough times throughout the breeding season. Essentially what you do is you take the male and then you cycle it through all your females. If you're doing multiple females for one male, I'd say, I'd say in most cases, most people will do like three to four females maximum. I'd say if you actually go go past three or four, you risk, you know, that male not really having enough to go around to multiple females. If you try to stretch it out, you know, one year I actually paired up a male to almost 10 females. As a matter of fact, most of those actually went, but I would say, you know, if you're having problems with slugs, it's because you're not cycling the male through your females enough or you're trying to spread them a little bit too thin. And what I usually do is I put the male with the female from usually between three and five days and then take them out and then and put them back in after about three or four weeks, pretty much once a month. As a matter of fact, in my very first year, I was putting them together like every week and a half. So I put them in for three or four days, and then I take them out and wait, you know, maybe a week, and then put them back in. And I was, you know, constantly cycling the male through all my females. And I found you really don't need to cycle them through that much, but you definitely just don't want to pair them up once. And then if you see a lock, separate them, and then that's it for the year. You have to keep putting them back with the female. Otherwise, you may end up with a lot of slugs. 
All right, so number four, this is probably one of the biggest ones that a lot of new people run into, and you actually see it a lot on YouTube. People, you know, start incubating their eggs, and they get to a certain point where they want to cut the eggs and look inside to see what they got before the hatchling actually starts coming out of the egg. And I would say this is pretty dangerous. A lot of people say that you can actually kill your hatchlings if you cut the egg too soon. And then what I've pretty much kind of dialed back to is I don't cut my eggs until I see the, the ball pythons start slitting the, the shell of the egg with their egg tooth. Then I know it's pretty safe to actually take a scissors, cut it open a little bit further, and then peek inside to see what the results are. And I never really rush the hatchling to come out of the egg. What I do is I cut it open a little bit, peek inside just for, to see the results, and then I close it back up and wait for the hatchling to come out on its own. As a matter of fact, my very first year, I think I lost a couple eggs cutting way too early. And the problem is, is if you're cutting an egg and it's like, uh, you know, several weeks too early and that hatchling is partially developed but not fully developed and you kind of, you know, some, sometimes you can actually, you know, scare the hatchling where it kind of crawls out of the egg really fast and it's not really ready to come out of the egg. And I think that is where you run into a lot of problems where you're having an immature hatchling come out of the egg too early and a lot of people have, I've, I've seen a lot of people where they lost quite a few hatchlings to egg cuttings and they've gotten to the point where they just make up this rule that say I am never ever gonna cut an egg ever again and let them all come out on their own and I think there's pros and cons to that too I think there's a time and a place for cutting as a matter of fact I've, I've seen some people where it, it almost seems like the hatchling doesn't cut the slits in the egg even in the really late stages if it's a few days past the time where it should be hatching and a lot of people go in cut the egg open and claim that they've actually saved their hatchling because you definitely want the hatchling to come out of the egg at the appropriate time you don't want them stuck inside the egg all right, so number five is one of the things that I've been working on here in the last year, and that has been you may have too much mold or bacteria in your egg boxes. And I've noticed this on some of my eggs, and let me tell you, a lot of these eggs, they can look pretty bad after two months incubation at 90 degrees and almost 100% humidity. And I would say in most cases, your ball python eggs or other snake eggs are pretty good handling a lot of mold and bacteria in that egg box. Well, let me tell you, you really want to minimize it. I've had some eggs go bad, and it seems like once they teeter on the brink where, you know, you have some eggs that look a little bad, and then all of a sudden, it seems like almost overnight, they go from looking a little bad to looking really bad. And I've actually tried to separate some of those eggs and move them to separate boxes, and I've tried antifungals, all kinds of stuff to try to save those eggs, and it seems like I just can't figure out how to save an egg once it gets past that stage and gets really moldy. So what I'm trying to do is kind of up front try to save the, the the eggs before they start getting moldy so a few of the things that I'll do is I'll actually wash my hands really good before I'm handling eggs I'll wash my hands sometimes in bleach water or really hot soapy bleach water sometimes I'll actually use gloves before I get in there and move the eggs and then I'll take the egg boxes before I prepare them and put them all together I'll put them in some bleach water and I'll soak them in the the lid and the the box and the egg crate and everything and make sure Everything is just, you know, I would say, I would say I don't really go to the point where it's actually super sterile, but I kind of take precautions up front to where I minimize the amount of mold and bacteria in my egg boxes. All right, so for number six, one of the things you really want to avoid, and that is egg turning during incubation. And for reptile eggs, you want to put them in the incubator, and then you just want to set them and forget them. You pretty much don't want to turn them at all. You want to really ensure that they don't roll in that egg box. And a lot of people actually put toothpicks or popsicles around there. Some people actually embed them kind of in the vermiculite so they don't move around. And what I do is I separate all the eggs and then kind of wedge them in the bottom of the incubation box and I've actually seen some people where they actually don't separate the eggs and they'll put the whole clump of eggs right in the incubation box and there's I say there's pros and cons to that you know for sure your eggs aren't gonna roll because they're all stuck together in one big clump but if one of the eggs goes bad I like to actually get in there and pull it out and kind of work with it keep it away from some of the good eggs I always like to separate my eggs but the problem is, is if you separate them all then you risk the eggs rolling during incubation. 
All right, so for number seven, this is kind of interesting. You actually want the embryos of your eggs facing up, and you can actually take your eggs and candle them and figure out where the embryo is. The embryo is like a round circle on the egg. You can see it especially right after the ball python or other snake has actually laid the egg. If you let that egg sit there for too long, let's say for example, if I go into some of these egg boxes like 30 days after incubation, try to candle them looking for the embryo, a lot of times the the shells thicken up so much that you can't even see the embryo. So you really want to make sure that the embryo is facing up at the beginning of the incubation. And it's kind of interesting, I've actually seen a scientific journal article where they actually took a whole bunch of eggs and they were ball python eggs, they put some of the embryos up and then they put some of the embryos down and they did a scientific study as far as the hatch rate and they found there's a little bit better hatch rate if the embryos are facing up. I'd say it's just barely significant. There's not that much of a difference. So if you actually have the embryo facing down, I would say you have a pretty good chance that that egg is going to hatch. But the interesting thing in that article, they said if the embryo is facing down, you end up with larger hatchlings, like a, a larger weight, a bigger weight for your hatchlings. I don't know if that was kind of a random anomaly that actually just happened, or if it's actually part of the development. But I thought it was kind of interesting following some of these scientific articles. All right, so for number eight, one of the things that could possibly affect your hatch rate, and that is your eggs could be damaged by impact. And it's kind of interesting if you think about it, you know, like for chicken eggs, if you look at a chicken egg that's fertile and you hold it up to the light, there's really no veins in that egg until it starts incubating. Versus if you took an egg from a ball python, you hold it up to a light and right as soon as it's laid, it has this intense network of veins all the way through the snake, which I would think would make the egg really susceptible to physical impact. You definitely don't want to damage the veins in that egg. And a lot of times when I'm actually going into the box or the tub to try to get those eggs from the female, it can be a little tricky if that female is like trying to bite you or especially if I'm like trying to separate the eggs. You know, I like to separate all the eggs on an individual basis. A lot of times I've had some really close calls trying to separate those eggs where I almost drop a big clump of eggs, like half of them almost almost fall when I'm pulling them apart. You have to be really careful. As a matter of fact, when I'm handling eggs, I always move really slow and make sure I don't have any physical impact because I don't want to affect the hatch rate of those eggs. All right, so for number nine, I would say this probably affects your length of incubation more than your hatch rate, and that is the temperature within your incubator. As a matter of fact, I kind of found out the hard way this year. My incubator, I had one of my fans went out and the temperature got really cold on the lower levels of my incubator. I think it got down in the 60s, and I didn't figure it out until about halfway through the season when I had that thing packed full of eggs, and then I figured out one of my fans went out and I was having a problem. And and the interesting thing is all those eggs actually hatched, but at a colder temperature, they hatched out about a week later than they would normally hatch. And that's one thing you have to keep in mind if you're thinking about cutting your eggs, make sure you know what your time and your temperatures are as far as when you can expect those hatchlings to come out. So a lot of times, you know, you're coming up to the 60 days and then you come up to, you know, 65, 66, and then you start thinking, you know, what's wrong with these eggs? Are they actually gonna hatch? Or do I need to go in and actually kind of cut them to rescue the hatchlings make sure they don't get stuck in the eggs and a lot of times it could be because you're not using the proper temperature in your incubator all right, so number 10 is kind of an unusual one, and that is where the umbilical cord wraps around the hatchling. And I've actually seen quite a few people on YouTube where they'll have sometimes a whole clutch of eggs that all die in the shell. None of them come out, and they go in trying to figure out what is going on with these hatchlings. They'll go in and cut open the eggs, and they'll find that the umbilical cord is actually wrapped around the snake. And I'm not sure if it's maybe because the eggs are rolling at the end of the incubation where they should be stationary or if it's some kind of genetic anomaly where it's something between the parents or the pairing or the genes where it's just not developing properly but I've actually seen quite a few people and they blame it on the umbilical cord wrapping around the hatchling kind of unusual I'm not quite sure how to prevent it but it's probably one of the biggest things that I've seen that kills hatchlings in the eggs all right, so it is time for the question of the day. And Brewer Boys Ball Pythons asks, when I'm incubating snake eggs, can I use cling wrap instead of press and seal? 
And that is a very good question. As a matter of fact, when I first started using press and seal, it kind of freaked me out because essentially what you're doing is you're taking a piece of plastic and completely blocking the airflow from the egg box. You're covering the whole egg box where there's no airflow in and out of the box. And I was worried that there wasn't enough air in there for the eggs or the hatchlings. And what must be happening is, you know, after doing this a couple of years with really good success, I'm thinking what must be happening is the air is actually transferring in and out of the box through the press and seal, kind of like a semi-permeable membrane, allows the air to go in and out, but it doesn't allow the moisture to escape. And that's really why it's the perfect thing to seal up your egg boxes. And I'm not sure if I'd actually chance going to a different type of plastic, unless you see someone else using it with good success, I'd pretty much stick with the press and seal. So that is pretty much it. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.